so I'm excited to bring out our next two guests. We are going to be joined by James Qual and Rachel Romer Carlson. James is uh, the Undersecretary of the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, he previously served as the president of the Institute for College Access and Success, which is a research and advocacy nonprofit dedicated to affordability and equity in higher education. Uh, he also served in the Obama administration as the Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor at the White House and Deputy Undersecretary at the Department of Education. Um, he helped organize the White House Summit on College Opportunity and served in senior roles in the House of Representatives and Senate. So we're really thrilled to have him here. And he'll be joined by Rachel Romer Carlson, who is the co-founder and CEO of Guild Education, an education and upskilling platform that prepares the workforce for the future. Uh, she also has experience in the public sector working for the 2008 Obama campaign uh, and serving in the Obama White House. So we're really excited to welcome them out to stage. So here to talk about the current administration's priorities on higher education, please give it up for James and Rachel. Everybody knew what my end goal was with Chipotle. It was like, I want to get into HR through Chipotle. Within three months, I was able to get kitchen manager and then I became an apprentice. I was an apprentice there a year and a half, maybe. And then I became the GM. Chipotle has a great culture. They believe in their people. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go to school and then hopefully I can get a corporate job. So when I was a GM, I was going to school two days a week. Iris is an example of somebody who wanted the opportunity, was eager, but was also willing to put in the work. When I heard about the opportunity, we immediately thought Iris. She was going to school for the role and she had the personality to go with it. So we just thought it was a perfect fit for her. I just graduated my BA in Human Resources and I am a field recruiter for Chipotle. It feels good because I was able to do it. I'm super excited because I got something that I really know I can be really good at. Awesome. Hi, everybody. That was Iris. We figured if we were going to talk about working adult learners today, we ought to ground ourselves in one of the 100 million in the US who we need to serve in this work. So I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to get to hang out with you, James. Um, let's start with uh, talking about the folks like Iris who aren't in school today. We know that in the pandemic, over a million students have fallen out of the higher ed system and would love to hear your perspective on how the Biden administration thinks about that problem and what we ought to do about it. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. It's great to be here. And we're very, very concerned about falling enrollment at our colleges and universities. And we track very carefully the number of financial aid applications we're getting. And uh, applications for next fall are down by more than 350,000 students. Uh, even from last year. So it's not clear that we can just relax and let these things come back on their own. I'm not sure that they will. Um, and about two thirds of those are adult students. So we see fewer high school seniors, a lower share of high school seniors, um, but also big drop offs among adults. And when you think about all the benefits of college for individuals and families and communities, it's really heartbreaking um, to think about the potential for a permanent dent in our educational attainment. So I think we need to take very seriously the challenge of how do we find um, these missing students? Um, how do we encourage them to enroll? Uh, we need to be thinking about programs that are fast, that have quick payoff, um, that are flexible. We need to think about advising and other kinds of support and community building that we've overlooked some in the past. Um, and then we need to adapt to the changing economy. And I know, you know, when we in the Biden administration look out, we see a bipartisan infrastructure bill. That's a million and a half jobs. Uh, we see big increases in supply chain, um, warehousing, transportation. Uh, we're expecting a lot of growth in the green economy. Um, but I wonder how that lines up with what you're seeing in terms of the changing labor market and, and what is the new normal going to be? Yeah, it, I think it's a really interesting time for the labor market. It, um, what I see coming down the pike that I think will be one of the first chapters in U.S. history where we've experienced this is intense labor shortage, but recessionary behavior. And that's going to be confusing for both the private sector and higher ed to figure out because normally in American recessions, we have labor surplus and people both go back to school and figure out okay, well, what, what's next for me? This is kind of the moment. And so higher ed's been very counter cyclical in the US. Um, we think in a recessionary environment with labor shortage, uh, you know, employers are gonna continue to pay more and more. Um, 
that is happening. But what's really interesting that we're seeing is that workers are saying, okay, I can now make 15 or $16 wherever I work. That's kind of a commodity wage. And that's a good thing for workers, but complicated for employers because they can't differentiate. And so in key job openings ranging from you know, um, entry-level data associates, truck driving, where there's massive shortages, um, a lot of customer service, healthcare, which is out of control in their labor shortages right now. They're realizing the difference they can offer to workers are skills. And workers don't ask for skills, they ask for career advancement. But new data just came out and Guild released a report today that 83% of our workers are saying, what I want most is career advancement. And 63% of workers are saying, I change jobs, not for wages, but to work somewhere that will give me career advancement. That's really different than what we've seen in prior economies. So we're enthusiastic that workers are asking for skills. I think what the private sector has to figure out is how to deliver it. Right. Yeah, so that's something we're seeing. On your side, I'd love to hear how the Biden administration and, and your team at the Department of Ed are thinking about how higher education can align programs and align their offerings to workforce demands, especially given how quickly the economy is moving. Yeah, it's a challenge, and it's often a challenge for colleges and universities or the types of providers that I work with most. I think there are two aspects of it that we see as contributions we can make to help empower people, and one is very good data. And we, in particular, have very good data on people who have received um, financial aid, and we can um, talk about completion rates, we can talk about program level outcomes, we can talk about different student groups, and more and more we have good employment outcome data too. And so I think that's a really important tool, not only for students, um, but also for colleges and for employers and trying to assess the value. I th the other piece of it that is really important part of our strategy is to try to bring try to bring parties together who um, don't necessarily work together usually. And a big part of that is colleges working with employers. And the reality is if you're a community college, um, it is more expensive to offer a career program typically than it is to offer um, a traditional academic program for transfer. It requires additional equipment. It requires skilled instructors who have competitive job offers. And so we're trying to put some of the money into those partnerships so that community colleges can work with local industries um, to create programs that will lead to jobs, not just at one employer, but at that are in demand in the area. You know, when we caught up recently, we talked a little bit about the fact that one of the shifts we're seeing in the labor market is we're, we're not only in a national labor market now, we're also in a national skills market. Uh, labor feels like they can attract talent anywhere in the country and COVID really accelerated that. And then from the skills perspective, learners feel like, well, I don't care if I get it from a regional brand or a national brand. I, I just want to acquire the skills. How's the Department of Ed thinking about how do we help community colleges and MSIs and HBCUs and others that have historically been really local? How do we help them solve some of those problems you're talking about with industry? What can the, what can the private sector do? Yeah, it's something that I hear a lot about from college leaders. And there's a challenge in that there's a bit of a scale mismatch. Because if you're a small employer, you often don't have the resources to go sit down with the college and map out the skills that you need and what programs. On the other hand, if you're a national employer, um, it doesn't make sense to work with a particular college that serves a particular area. So you need to think about how do you line up those skills um, nationally, and that's a big challenge. Yeah, I think that's something we're hoping that some of the larger employers can provide a public service of sorts in serving their own needs, but also sharing some of the data about what they're seeing. Because the striking thing that we find in our work with employers on one side and university partners on the other is that at some level, the average CEO now has more insight into the skills we need five years from now than, an, uh, than a university president has access to. And that's a problem. We need to get that data available to everybody. I have been to some campuses that are really leaning into this. And you asked about some of the colleges that serve um, populations that are trying to move up into the middle class. And those places, we really need to be valuing them as a country because those are the people that are um, creating upward mobility, they're expanding college opportunity to the people that don't have it. And that's why you hear President Biden talking so much about community colleges, historically black colleges, other minority serving institutions. And some of them are doing incredible things. I was on the campus of Morgan State uh, in Maryland a couple of um, weeks ago, and they're talking about their new programs in 
equitable AI and megatronic computing. I met some students there building a rocket that's going to go into outer space next year. So, you know, those institutions really are trying to look to the future and prepare their students for not just what we need now, but what we're going to need for in the decades to come. Uh, it's, it's exciting to see that kind of work. As I mentioned, the idea of HBCUs leading the work on equitable AI feels like a home run for this country. Um, shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about student debt. Uh, Y'all had a big announcement today, and, and as we discussed, there's really two elements to it around uh, helping students who have current loan debt and then also default. Do you mind sharing a little bit for anybody who didn't read the news this morning? Uh, sure. So President Biden announced today that uh, he was extending the pause on student loan payments and student loan interest until the end of August. And that's because even though the economy is coming back very well, we need to have a bit of an on-ramp for consumers who are struggling with all these debts um, and not throw them directly into the deep end. So we're going to extend it for a couple of more months. He also announced that everyone would be coming back into good standing. So if you were delinquent two years ago or you were defaulted and struggling to keep up, you're going to get another chance. And that is really important for some of the first generation college students of color who um, really have been struggling under their student loan debt. Before the pause, we saw a million students a year defaulting on their federal loans. And that's really a heartbreaking statistic. Um, as it's really exciting. Um, we're really enthused by it. You know, you and I have talked a little bit about the role of the public sector in one place in terms of really thinking about eliminating student debt. Um, and, and then we've talked a little bit about where the private sector can help. But I'd, I'd love to hear, are there any other, you know, you've got a real diverse crowd here. As you think about the ecosystem of organizations, what do you and, and what does the Biden administration hope to see from all of us on student debt? Yeah, well, I mean, I think from our part, there's a there's kind of a three prong strategy, and one is making very big investments up front so that we are paying now for the education opportunities that we want people to have instead of asking them to borrow for the future. And that's where doubling the Pell Grant, free community college. Um, the second part of the strategy is to do what we can to offer debt relief. And we have worked very hard in places where the department has clear authority, where people are eligible. We've canceled some 700,000 loans so far. And these are people who were permanently disabled, who were cheated by a for-profit college, who are in public service. And then third, we need to think about what kind of standards we have at the very lowest performing colleges. And um, there are places that just routinely turn out students who can't afford to repay their loans. And we need to have some standards around that. Um, I think it's, um, I think it's wonderful and amazing that the private sector is starting to think about their role in the student debt. And, and, and you know, what have you seen there, Rachel? Well, I, I think on the employer side, we see a really great opportunity to prevent debt in the first place. I think, obviously, we've got an existing problem that America needs to dig its way out of in the, is it 1.3 trillion? What's the number today? More? Okay. Um, our perspective is that uh, we meet a lot of the 36 million Americans with some college, no degree. Many of them have accumulated debt. We're thrilled what you all are doing to help those students. And then as we get them into college completion programs, our goal is to figure out how can an employer help them go back to school debt free. So today, across the folks we work with, uh, the 5 million sample size um, in our network, we find that 97% of students are able to graduate school entirely debt free with their employer's support. Um, and that 3% tends to be books, lab fees, or, or sometimes if they go over that 5250 um, cap that employers are currently capped. And we, we hope Congress takes action on that so that um, employers can support even more of their employees' education. But I, I think there's a massive role for the private sector to play in preventing student debt in the first place. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Let's hope they're listening, right? We'll, we'll hope all of America's employers are listening to that. Um, shifting gears a little bit, but just digging deeper into the student experience, how do you all think about where, and I'd love to hear what the Biden administration's perspective is on just adult learners in general? Because it can get really easy for so much of higher ed to think about the 18-year-old, the, you know, the, the mom and dad are dropping off in the minivan on the way to college. But what are you all doing and what are you going to continue to do to think about the adult learner that you mentioned is that group that's dropping out at an even higher rate? Yeah, it, adult learners are just so important if we're trying to reach our goals as a country. And, um, you know, in President Biden's vision, you know, higher education really is part of the solution to our country's problems. It is a, 
a, a institution that has potential, unlike few others, to promote upward mobility, to promote equitable opportunity, uh, to help us understand each other in a time where that's needed more than ever. Um, and yet we have uh, nationally only a 62% graduation rate. So as you say, there's some 30, 38 million adults out there with some college, no degree. And we have a lot of adults who feel that they need some additional credential to um, move up in their careers and serve their um, families. So it's a big focus area. And a lot of our programs traditionally were designed with the idea that you have a 18 year old going full time living on campus. And we need to think about new approaches that are built around uh, flexible schedules, um, um, uh, asynchronous learning, um, quick payoffs, so you're not at an associate program for six years part-time, but instead you're able to get a credential quickly that has payoff while you continue to go in school. And so those are the kinds of you know um, important strategies that we're trying to support. Uh, building on that, you have a lot of entrepreneurs in the room who spend their time thinking about innovation in education. Um, if you were to put out, if you were to wave your magic wand or put out your wish list, what sort of innovation do you hope this crowd is driving? Great question. I mean, I think really some of the most exciting stuff I've seen is around how do you use data to figure out which students are struggling and then help them succeed. And that sounds pretty basic, um, but places are struggling. Places are struggling with it. And it's um, really incredible when you look at places that have figured out how to do this well. Um, you know, and we, we talk a lot about Georgia State, which has raised its graduation rate by 16 percentage points. It has completely closed um, gaps by race. It now produces more um, black uh, four-year college graduates than any other institution in the country. And it's done it by being very, very careful about using data to identify which students are likely to fall off, where in the process, and then experiment around different ways to keep, um, to keep them on track. That similar strategy is being used by the Cal State system across the entire Cal State system. Now we're up six percentage points. So if we once thought that um, you know college was about weeding people out and maybe um, not everyone was college material and maybe it was students' faults that they weren't succeeding at higher rates, we now know that's not true. We have examples, not just boutique programs, but large colleges, even large college systems, are really driving improvements at scale. And so I think the, the place where we really could use that expertise is in mining that data for insight and how do we continue to drive improvement so that we have a higher ed system that, you know, when people take out a loan, they know that's a good investment and it's, uh, they're on a reliable path to a college degree and a better future. That uh, is exciting to hear because I think student success has to be a massive part of the equation. And as we've seen through the pandemic, our working adults are going through more mayhem than ever before. They are working full-time jobs. They're in part-time programs. Um, we also know coaching costs more. And in lots of schools, it feels like a zero-sum addition. But I think one of the cool things that we're seeing in a lot of ecosystems are that organizations that are able to cut out some of the advertising and marketing spend, which adds no value to students, are then able to invest more in coaching and other models. And I, I've met a bunch of cool founders this week who are working on that. You mentioned data. Um, what, is, what might we hope for from the department in terms of increased data? And then for those of us who are in the field collecting smaller amounts of data, what do you hope that we all publish and share out? Yeah. So. Um... The House of Representatives just passed something called the College Transparency Act, which would give us a lot more authority to collect data on how students progress, and we would um, have um, ability to cut it in a lot more useful ways. Um, in the meantime, we have obviously pretty rich data on people who get um, student aid and people who have student loans, how they move through the system, when they graduate, um, whether they struggle to repay their loans. We're working on data matches with other federal agencies, so we have one with IRS, we're working on census that allows us in a totally privacy protected, totally secure way, able to talk about the different outcomes, the different ROI, who's struggling to graduate at a particular institution. And um, I think that's a really valuable contribution that we're making to the community and I hope people find it useful. I think we would welcome input on what is the, um, the best types of data we can be producing, um, what does the field need from us, and what type of data you know, should be done at the state level, at, at the institution level, at the employer level. I think there are a lot of folks 
thinking about that. So I imagine you're going to get some emails taking you up on that offer. Um, uh, I, I think as we wrap up, uh, any closing comments of things that are on the Biden administration's radar or that you think this crowd ought to know or be supportive of as we march forward and hopefully getting a lot of these folks back to school and ideally into the middle class? Well, actually, I have a question for you. So, <laughs> uh, you know, and I do think the employer role here is really, really critical. And when you're thinking about serving adult students, obviously, one of our biggest challenges is identifying them and reaching them and encouraging them to enroll. We talk some about quality control. And from the federal level, it's not clear that our money is always spent on high quality programs. And um, financing, obviously, is an important part of the picture. Um, but when you look at employer-provided programs, sometimes participation is maybe um, pretty low, actually. And uh, it's not always clear that these credentials lead uh, students to something that is uh, valuable to them. So what do you see as the right place for the federal government to partner with employers? And how can we make sure that we're getting the most pr productivity out of that? Okay, I have a short clock and I'm going to go fast. You thought about that yeah, ever? Yeah, I thought a little bit about that. Let me nail it if I can. One, usage rates go up when we don't ask employees to front the money. Tuition reimbursement sounds nice. It ain't because the worker has to pay up front. And we know that white collar, white male populations are the only ones using that program in aggregate with any success. Other demographics struggle. So we need to make sure that like a 401k and like healthcare, the employee doesn't have to front the money, period. That takes payments technology, and thank you to every university and learning provider in the room who's worked with us to change that model, and thank you to those of you who don't yet who want to work with us to change that. We have to do that. We have to. Um, the second thing on quality, uh, we want help on this. We're doing our best in our own data sets today to constantly evaluate programs for quality outcomes, and we do that by looking at the employer's promotion rates. We know that IRIS and Chipotle employees who are in the learning programs that they've curated are being promoted at 7x the rate of their peers who aren't in the program. But we don't know about the students who leave Chipotle. We don't have access to their IRS data in an aggregated sense to measure it. So I'll flip it right back on you. We would love a data set that lets us help measure the economic mobility of every American learner so we can hold programs accountable. Great. <laughs> Sounds great. I'd love to make that promise, but they're about to cut off my mic, I think. Yeah, there you go. The, the mics are being cut off. Thank you all. Thanks so much.